James Christopher Scarborn. In the early hours of July 5, 1999, in international waters between Miami, Florida and San Juan, Puerto Rico, 22-year-old James Cavone vanished from Carnival Cruise Line's destiny ship. James was on the cruise ship with his best friend, Jeff, and 12 members of Jeff's family for a seven-day trip to the Caribbean. At around midnight, James and his friends had been at the ship's disco enjoying a few drinks. At about 12.30 am, James told the boys he was going to the men's room. James was never seen again. When his friends returned to the cabin at 3 am, they assumed James had met someone and would return in the morning. By 10 am, James still had not returned, so the friends went to the ship's authorities to have him paged. James never answered. By 10 pm and after a thorough cabin-to-cabin -cabin search by crew members, James was still missing. A few weeks later, James' mother asked for the itemized bill from James' sale card. Her son had not gone anywhere or purchased anything after he left the disco, and he never re-entered his cabin. In 2006, after viewing James's case on television show Primetime, a woman recognized James as a person who went missing from the Destiny cruise ship that she was also on July 5, 1999. The woman told James's family that on the morning of July 5, 1999, her cabin phone rang and she heard a young man on the other end say, Help me, I can't get out of here. Then she heard a scream, what sounded like furniture being thrown around the room, and some scuffling. The phone went dead thereafter. The woman was interviewed by the ship authorities and the FBI. She said that later in the week, she asked about James, and the ship told her that he had been engaged prior to the trip. His fiancée had broken up with him, so he probably committed suicide. According to the woman, this is a complete lie. She contacted Carnival Cruise Corporate Office after the trip, in the hopes of being able to contact James's family. Carnival Cruise told her that they had no record of anyone disappearing from the destiny on July 5, 1999. James remains missing to this day, and foul play is not suspected in his disappearance. There have been no recent updates on his case. Number 2. Marion Lynn Carver Marion Lynn Carver, 40 years old, from Cambridge, Massachusetts, was a former investment banker who loved to write poetry. She was sailing aboard Celebrity Cruises Mercury when she disappeared on August 28, 2004. She had a 13-year-old daughter who was staying with her ex-husband in England. She took CDs of her poems with her, but no computer. They were left in her handbag in her room. She didn't tell the 13-year-old daughter whom she spoke on the phone daily that she was taking a cruise, nor did she tell her parents. Her parents found out she was missing when they were called by her granddaughter after her calls to her mother had gone unanswered. Her parents tried to reach her for several days without success, then filed a missing persons report. A police investigation five weeks later determined that she had taken a cruise and then went missing. She purchased round-trip airfare with her cruise, which is frequently cheaper than one way, which suggests that she wasn't planning on committing suicide. On night two of the cruise, she was suddenly missing. She never slept in the bed from night two on. Her cabin steward, Domingo Montero, reported her not using her cabin numerous times and was told to shut up and mind his own business when he reported her missing to his superior and he was told to keep putting fresh chocolates on her pillow. The report was never taken any higher in the chain of command. Her belongings had remained in her cabin when everybody else got off the ship. Her cabin steward told his superior this. He asked his boss, should we report this? The boss says, no, I'll take care of it. Just put all her belongings in a bag, put them in my locker and I'll take care of it. Her handbag had her wallet with her name, social security number and everything. They just put it in a storage, did nothing. No missing persons report was filed with the police by the cruise line. Nor did they attempt to reunite the handbag with money and identification with the owner. At some point during the five weeks, the cruise ship decided to give away her belongings that had been in storage to charity. After the carvers started complaining, Royal Caribbean had held an internal hearing and fired Montero's boss. But for the three months that the carvers had been asking questions, the cruise line had never shared that information with them. After her father, Kendall Carver, began his own investigation, hiring one of the world's largest private detective agencies, 
and was being serviced by Tim Schmolder, private detective from San Francisco who was on the case, Domingo's superior was terminated. Memos went out to 14 other employees on board, wanting to know if Domingo had talked to anyone about this event. Kendall Carver said the Royal Caribbean's own documents offer evidence of cover-up. One memo shows that months earlier, company officials knew Montero had reported suspicious circumstances to his supervisor. The Carvers demanded Royal Caribbean produce a list of other passengers from the Boston area, where their daughter had left, in case there was a friend or someone who might have known about Marion. Kendall Carver said that the subpoenas produced a list of ship's 2,000 passengers with no contact information. Marion ordered two sandwiches through room service on night two and was never seen after that. On night two, she or somebody left the entire trip tip for the room steward $108 instead of leaving the tip on the last day of the cruise as is common, on a table with his name card on top of it. She never used the return portion of the airline ticket. Her father has spent more than $75,000 to date to get answers to the question, what happened to his daughter? He has also founded the International Cruise Victim Not-For-Profit Organization. Royal Caribbean's lawyer, Jeffrey Maltzman, denied any kind of cover-up and later said in a press release that she appeared to have committed suicide on the ship. Her family denies she committed suicide and believes their handling of the case will prevent them from ever knowing what happened. Number 3. Tammy Grogan In 2006, Tammy Grogan was on board Carnival Cruise Line's Imagination when she vanished somewhere between Mexico and Miami into the waters of the Gulf. Travelling with her were her mother Bonnie, her 14-year-old son Jimmy and an aunt Deb. The trip's final stop before heading home was in Mexico and family reported seeing Tammy on the ship after that time at about 1.30 am Sunday, September 10. The next day, Tammy was nowhere to be seen. At first, her family thought she was entertaining herself somewhere. But when the ship finally docked in Florida and she still hadn't appeared, they became concerned. By the time they told the ship of her disappearance, a full 32 hours had passed. The information desk put out a page, but no one responded. Sadly, the imagination had traveled more than 400 miles since Tammy was last seen. That meant it was too late to send out a search party. Instead, the Coast Guard contacted the Mexican authorities who sent a message to the vessels in the area. But Tammy was never found. Reports in the days after her disappearance stated foul play was not suspected. But here's where it gets weird. About 18 months later, Bonnie gave an interview to local news claiming that the trip had been an elaborate ruse to dispose of Tammy. She accused Craig Morgan, the man who had purchased the cruise tickets for the family, of planning her death so that he might have unfettered access to Jimmy, the 14-year-old son. Morgan had reportedly showered the boy with gifts and attention, taking him on limo rides and lavishing him with jewellery, including no less than 23 watches. However, this lavish display of affections were unsettling for Tammy. Tammy reportedly became uncomfortable enough with this that she eventually told her son he could no longer spend time with Morgan. Shortly thereafter, Morgan purchased the cruise tickets for Aunt Deb as a reward for losing 100 pounds and told her to invite Bonnie, Tammy and Jimmy along. Once on board the imagination, Bonnie and Tammy realized that Morgan's sister and her ex-boyfriend were also on the ship and indeed were rooming right near them. On the night Tammy disappeared, Bonnie claims that she had been in Tammy's cabin. She claims she did not drink any alcohol. But when she drank a glass of water given to her by Jimmy, she blacked out. Bonnie alleges that she was secretly given Ruhepnol, a powerful sedative said to have been 10 times stronger than Valium. In 2010, WTOL News reported that forensic experts did find evidence of Ruhepnol in Bonnie's drink. But that claim has not been corroborated by other outlets. A more widely reported claim is that Morgan did some research on Ruhepnol evidenced by the handwritten note found by investigators. Morgan's reasoning was that his sister Rebecca was having problems sleeping and he was trying to help her. Finally, when the family returned home four days later without Tammy, they found that her apartment had been broken into and her computer hard drive and jewelry Morgan had given her was missing. Meanwhile, Jimmy himself went missing in 2009. 
After living with his potential grandfather for more than two years, he graduated from high school and fulfilled his lifelong dream of enlisting in the military. But on September 29, he went AWOL from Fort Benning in Georgia and never finished his basic training. He is no longer in touch with Bonnie or the grandfather. Bonnie believes he was involved. Number 4. George Smith In 2005, George Smith and Jennifer Hegel were enjoying a wedding cruise in the Mediterranean. But on July 5th, something went terribly wrong. George Smith mysteriously disappeared never to be seen again. According to some of 2,300 passengers on board the Royal Caribbean Brilliance of the Seas, the honeymooning Smiths were heavy partiers who had a drink and gambled well into the night and early morning on the day Smith disappeared. A police officer and his wife were in the cabin next door to the Smiths and reported that noisy parties were the rule in the Smiths cabin, usually into the wee hours of the morning. The officer was awakened at about 4 am on July 5th by loud noises from the cabin next door perhaps another party in the smith's room. This time though, the officer and his wife heard yelling and arguing, the sound of heavy items being moved around the cabin next door, and then more noise from the balcony area next door to them. All of this was followed by a final loud noise, with other passengers reporting a scream and then for the first time in 30 minutes, nothing but silence from the smith's cabin. The daylight of July 5th found George Smith missing from his cabin with blood on the cabin floor, the bed on the rail of the balcony and a bloody handprint on the lifeboard just below the balcony of Smith's room. Smith was nowhere to be found and a missing persons investigation took place. Jennifer was under suspicion for disappearance of her husband, though she claimed to have no memory of the night before. She was found at 4.30 in the morning passed out in the hallway a blackout that could explain her memory loss. George's parents brought in Ivy Barnum and Nomara LLC's Michael Jones to help them investigate the case and to see if he could provide more answers. He immediately got to work pursuing the ship documents and interviewing the four men last seen with George. Two of them plead the fifth. One had a foggy memory of the events and the last was serving prison time in Florida for trafficking. The man in prison, Greg Rosenberg, was the most forthcoming out of any of the suspects. All of the men claimed to have ordered room service at the time of George's disappearance, but the timeline of the events is still suspicious. They were the ones who supposedly put him to bed before going back to their rooms and ordering room service. However, the ship made no record of the large room service ordered by the four suspects. 48 Hours reported later that Michael Jones said a video involving three of the four men could be the key to crackling the case. Jones told 48 Hours they pass a video camera around filming themselves, commenting about George's death in a very callous way. But the really incriminating statement is one of them stands up at the end of the tape and sort of hunches his shoulders and flashes gang signs and says, Told ya, I was a gangster. And in the context of the discussion about George's death, almost as if he's bragging about having done something to George. None of the men in the video have been charged and all say they had nothing to do with George's death. This video was in possession of the cruise line by the end of the cruise and later in the possession of the FBI which did not disclose it to any of the family members. It eventually became known to the Smith family only after 7 years after the incident. In 2015, FBI closed its investigation coming to the conclusion that there was insufficient evidence of murder. George's parents still have no idea what happened to their son. Number 5. Annette Meisner Annette Meisner, 37 years old, from Waukesha, Wisconsin, was traveling with her parents Wally and Heidi Nerler and teenage daughter Danielle aboard Carnival Cruise Line's Carnival Pride. She was part of a group of 200 passengers from the Las Vegas Hilton. On the last night of West Coast cruise from Los Angeles, while off the coast of Mexico, Annette had left to play bingo. She had won at bingo twice already on the cruise and was supposed to meet her parents for the 10 pm bingo. In fact, she wanted to arrive early to get a good seat. When she didn't show up, her parents became concerned and her father began to look for her. He searched for her in the casino. A witness said she was in the casino at 9.30 pm. As he continued to search, he heard her name paged and became very worried. The crew had found her handbag on the deck and had paged her to give it back. The page was around 10.10 pm. 
her small black beaded evening bag along with overturned drink glass and scattered papers were found alongside a railing on a lower deck of the cruise ship a security camera was tampered with actually covered with a paper near that location yet no cruise ship crew or security noticed the covered camera or the image not on the monitor in the security beads from her purse were found on the deck appearing to have been ripped from the purse in a struggle that was the single most important clue to her parents that a struggle had taken place spots of blood were also found on the deck near the purse her daughter states that there was a man harassing her mother aboard the ship security had been notified of this many times and refused to assist the cruise line says the ship's crew launched a room by room search of the pride after mysena's daughter daniel and other passengers noticed she was missing that search took 3 hours and during that time the ship continued on their course then they called the us coast guard which told the ship to turn around and search the waters the ship was turned around at around 2 am the us coast guard joined in the search with aircraft and a navy ship and searched the waters for 16 hours searching 833 square miles before the search was called off at the time of her disappearance mysena and her husband had recently adopted two other children and had launched a new business together selling dietary supplements the business was a dream come true and she was very excited about it and having the adopted children she also had a pending case as plaintiff for child support for children of a past marriage indicating she had plans to continue her life peter nola and its brother said she was in good spirits and there is no way she committed suicide early on john meisner claimed the fbi suspected foul play in consistency in crew responses to questioning of the disappearance john meisner claimed of communication failure between carnival and the fbi the agency told the family several months after she vanished that there is evidence in crime lab preventing the probe's completion there was also one unidentified suspect who was the first person that found an its purse and coincidentally at the very same time two guards arrived and collected the handbag he is known to have made at least six trips back and forth to the scene of the crime but he was eventually ruled out as a suspect after fingerprint and dna test results turned out negative finally a judge declared meisner officially dead but the family who ruled out suicide and suspected foul play still have no answers <laughs>